inflammatory back pain. This is different than the usual back pain that we think about when our back hurts. Ankylosing spondylitis, also known as bamboo spine disease, is an inflammatory arthritis of the spine. The vertebras of the spine fuse together, kind of looks like the stick of a bamboo. Ankylosing spondylitis, which affects millions of people worldwide, about 0.5% of the world population. Seen more often in men, seen more often in young people, usually between the ages of 17 and 45. It has to be taken care of early so we can minimize problems later on. Why is it so important to talk about this condition? One word, misdiagnosis. Amongst autoimmune diseases, there is a lot of misdiagnosis. Ankylosing spondylitis really is up there. Usually when we look at medical textbooks and who could get ankylosing spondylitis, we think of a young Caucasian male, possibly with a genetic test positive called HLA B27. What happens if you're a young Chinese woman or an older black woman or none of these? Could you still have this condition? Absolutely but the pickup is much more difficult if you don't hit all the check marks, which is why it's so important to talk about because there are people right now, today, that are going to the wrong specialists and clinicians because they don't realize what they actually have is inflammatory back pain and not the regular wear and tear back pain that we think about. Like when I hurt my back, uh, it could be from degenerative changes, like a herniated disc, and sometimes you don't even know why you got it. But inflammatory back pain is from an autoimmune condition in which you're going to have problems with flexibility and stiffness and a whole host of other things if it's not taken care of. And even though it's a disease of the back, it can affect tendons and ligaments, other areas of the body, including your eyes. So there's so much that's a part of it that's not just the back. And what it usually is, is when you're waking up in the morning, you're feeling really stiff and it takes a while to kind of get moving. Exercise tends to help it. And so do medications like anti-inflammatories what we call NSAIDs. And we're gonna to get to that in a few seconds because there's some things that you must know about this condition. Number one, ankylosing spondylitis is associated with some other factors. Smoking, have a higher BMI, body mass index, or being overweight, more associated with high cholesterol, high blood pressure, osteoporosis, vertebral fractures. Yes, low bone density, because again, it's an inflammatory disease. It's not just a regular, I have back pain. This is inflammation working away at your bones. So yes, there's a higher chance of osteoporosis. Something else that's really come to attention in the last few years though for ankylosing spondylitis is that there's a higher risk of hip fractures. See, we all think about back pain and we think about back stiffness and how it affects the back. It affects the tendon, the ligaments, the vertebra of the back, but also what is connected to the back? It's the hips, right? So you can also have poor hip flexibility. And on top of that, I just told you osteoporosis or low bone density, the inflammation is working away on that. So there's a higher chance of hip fractures in a younger age. Hip fractures are a major cause of dying. You know, as our population gets older, this is more common as it is. And on top of that, if you have this condition, it is certainly more possible to get. Something else that's really come to attention recently is what does weight have to do with ankylosing spondylitis? A higher BMI or body mass index is associated with more inflammatory activity. And we don't know if it's really the disease itself or the fact that we consider fat to be inflammatory. And so is that what's causing the inflammation? Either way, we want the medications to work. If you're going to take the medications, it's good to keep a healthy BMI so that they actually work for you. Exercise. Okay, this is a big one for ankylosing spondylitis. All rheumatic diseases, we suggest exercise. However, in this one, it's particularly important because it is actually something that modifies the disease process. People do better with exercise. This is a long-term disease. You wanna maintain as much flexibility as you can, not only in the back, also in the neck and your other areas, right? There are people that can no longer look from side to side or down or up when they have ankylosing spondylitis if they haven't been getting treatment or it hasn't worked adequately. And also what type of exercise do we want? There actually has been studies on this and in a recent one, there was uh, 30 volunteers in the study, and in one group, it was spinal flexibility exercise, and the other group was spinal flexibility exercise plus aerobic exercise. Guess which one did better? Okay, the second group, the one that did both spinal flexibility and aerobic exercise, they definitely did better in outcomes with ankylosing spondylitis. So yes, you need to also get that heart rate up and do aerobic activity. Now, what about yoga versus aerobic activity? 
which one did better? Actually, trick question. They both did fairly decent. So you could choose either one, but you just need to do it. Now, there was a Chinese study in 2020 that actually was really interesting. It was a wearable study where they were given a device to wear to see if that would help with movement and flexibility and exercise. Because as they put it, not everybody can make it to big medical centers and do weeks and weeks of physical therapy. They have lives. So why not do it at home with a wearable device? What happened? It worked. People did better when they were using these wearable devices and doing their own exercise. But, but what was preventing them from doing all the exercise? It was a lack of time, a lack of energy, and a lack of willpower. Well, that kind of affects us in so many different ways, in so many different processes. So it's not just ankylosing spondylitis. But yes, movement did help. Now, is there any type of movement to avoid? Well, actually there is. What's important in ankylosing spondylitis is to avoid kind of jerking activity or too much loaded pressure, for example, on the neck, like you may not want to work for a moving company and carry heavy boxes because that could perhaps affect your neck flexors and your spine more. So not the best job for ankylosing spondylitis. Another one was, I remember when I worked in New York City and I would have all these cab drivers as patients and I would just think the stop, start, stop, start kind of movement, especially in a place like New York City, is not really good for somebody who has ankylosing spondylitis because imagine how much it affects the neck. Or if you're doing a high impact exercise, a high impact sport, like for example, tennis or basketball, it's not that you can't do them, it's that it's a little more risky when you have ankylosing spondylitis because the inflammation can be at the tendons and ligaments. If you're in full remission and you want to give it a try, that might be better than somebody who is really not having good control of the disease and then they want to go out and try all these sports. Probably not the best thing. Lower impact like yoga, tai chi, badminton, those might be a little bit better. But if somebody is a high intense sport athlete and they are well controlled on these drugs, it's a risk balance, you know, and I have people like that and they try to do everything else in their life to control these factors like lifestyle, diet, exercise, along with the medication to see if their ankylosing spondylitis does better. And they often do just fine. What about the diet? Right food is so impactful. How about in this condition? Well, I would say we have much more diet studies in other rheumatic illnesses than we do in AS. The gut microbiome. It is an area for study in so many diseases because there has been thoughts that there's a connection between what you eat, how your gut is processing it, recognizing it, and what diseases may manifest because of issues between your gut and your body. Now, what did they see in AS? There was a study, it was average size, about 200 patients, and they took 100 ankylosing spondylitis patients and 100 healthy controls. And they collected stool samples for all of them and they kept them frozen. They took them immediately, froze them, transferred them to a lab facility, froze them again until they were evaluated. And they found that Bacteroidetes was the most represented class in these samples, but it was also the most represented class of bacteria in normal samples. So they definitely have some of the same, but there were differences seen. Gut microbiome in ankylosing spondylitis is different than those of healthy controls. Now, is it the disease that has made it different or was it different to begin with and therefore you got the disease? There are still a lot of questions to be answered. 2024, a Turkish abstract has been published where they use the Dietary Inflammatory Index on 21 people, ages 19 to 64. They believe, according to their evaluation, that a diet containing omega-3 fatty acids and monounsaturated fatty acids, which presumably have anti-inflammatory effects, can help improve disease activity in ankylosing spondylitis. Is this going to pan out in a larger trial, randomized control trial? Well, I hope so, but we don't know that data yet. Another study reported on fiber and ankylosing spondylitis, and they found that an increase in fiber consumption decreased the inflammation in AS. Dietary studies are hard to do though, because there is often recall bias along with other biases. For example, if you were asked, what did you eat yesterday or last week? You will try your best to remember, especially if it's for a study, but you may not remember everything accurately, or it could be that you may not prefer to tell everything accurately. Either way, there is bias, so it's really hard to do diet studies. So we need to see them replicated on a larger scale. There is a spot of good news. Now with ankylosing spondylitis, we have so many treatments out there. 
and yet one of the mainstay of treatments, and in fact, the first line of treatment is something called NSAIDs or anti-inflammatories. You might have heard of ibuprofen, Advil, Aleve, but in ankylosing spondylitis, we use it kind of more as a daily medication and sometimes at very high doses of it, and that can control disease activity. Like in our other conditions, we'll say, okay, take it when you have pain, don't necessarily take it all the time. But in this particular condition, we do say that sometimes, especially in very mild or early disease, that may be all somebody needs. But we worry about the, the risk of heart attacks and strokes and, and the risk to your gut and your kidneys. So we worry about so many things when we say take NSAIDs. There was a study from 2020 that said, actually, even though people took a lot of NSAIDs in ankylosing spondylitis, there wasn't necessarily more heart events or cardiovascular events. So that was at least a little bit reassuring for us since we prescribed so much of it. But again, you still have to be careful because we don't know how it'll affect each individual person. There is a lot to take in with ankylosing spondylitis. The medications are getting better and better, but also so important to try to improve all of the lifestyle interventions that you can, that you have to improve all around you. So whether it's diet, exercise, mental health, because it's definitely associated with depression and poor quality of life, right? When you can't move and you're not flexible and you can't do all the things you want to do. So you have to kind of try to modify all these things in your life. It's not easy to do, but it's something that has to be a part of this process with ankylosing spondylitis. I'm Dr. Banasali, and if you want to see more videos on autoimmune disease and how it affects our health, you can check this one next.